This meeting of uh, the executive committee to order and particularly this part of it, the police advisory committee. First off is the land acknowledgement. I would like to begin by, by acknowledging that we are in the Gmagi, the district of Spaganegadi, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kma'ki people. Next on the agenda is approval of, the, of uh, the agenda of all subcommittees. What is your wish? So moved. Second. Moved by Councillor Green, seconded by Deputy Warden Mitchell. All those in favor? Aye. Contrary of mine, motion is carried. Uh, next up, approval of the minutes of February 15, 2022. What is your wish? Moved by Deputy Warden Mitchell, seconded by Councillor Green. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary of mine, motion is carried. At this time, uh, uh, I'd like to introduce to the Police Advisory Committee uh, two new council members. Uh, one may be a familiar, one is a familiar face, uh, but uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce Ruth Ann Greeno to my left and my far, far left, uh, Mr. Greg Densmore. No, sure. Now, uh, there is an oath, and that will be administered by our CAO. CAO? Uh, so I will read the oath for you folks to listen to and affirm or swear to, and then Shirley, I think, has put the oath on your desk for signature. Uh, I swear or affirm that I will faithfully, diligently, and impartially execute and perform the duties required of me as a member of the East Hance Police Advisory Committee. And while I continue to hold office, I will, to the best of my judgment, skill, knowledge, and ability, carry out, discharge, and perform all the duties of my office faithfully, impartially, and according to the Police Act or any other act in any regulation, rule, or bylaw and will not, except in the discharge of my duties, disclose to any person any matter or evidence brought before the East Hans Police Advisory Committee. So help me God, I so, I so swear or affirm. You do? You do? Yeah. I do. I do. Perfect. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Shirley, you will sign them in and take those. You. Next order of business would be the RCMP quarterly report and specialized services lifts. Staff Sergeant Bushel, good morning. So we'll follow our, uh, am I live? You're live. Thank you. Uh, we'll follow our regular format this morning. We've prepared a uh, slideshow uh, agenda. We'll talk about our HR update, uh, our operations update, calls for service since last meeting. I'd like to bring uh, forward a uh, new little bit of information on the Association of Chiefs of Police, and something that's been in, perhaps in the news recently, and and um, you may have questions. And then uh, final uh, final place for any other thoughts or questions that you may have for us. So our standing uh, officer and employee count is 31. Uh, that's 27 police officers for detachment assistance. Currently we, uh, we have a, a shortage of four due to illness and three awaiting transfer in. So these are members that we're expecting to arrive within the next couple of months. Pleased to say that Constable Chris Waters started yesterday. He's a new member that just came from Ontario. Uh, Corporal Evan Collier, he's en route from uh, Nunavut, Baker Lake. He'll be uh, replacing one of our corporals. JP Harvey is uh, en route from Shelburne. He's a serving member down there. Constable Ron Faulkner, uh, he's en route from Halifax. He'll be uh, exchanging positions with uh, one of our SKU members. And uh, we're also seeking, currently seeking a backfill for, for another vacancy. Uh, so I said three arrival uh, that we're waiting on. The um, 
JP Harvey, uh, his transfer has yet to be cut, but we anticipate that's going to be cut shortly. Also, our bonus member, Corporal Mike Zinn, he's the dog handler, uh, so he's coming from Manitoba. And again, just a reminder, that's at no cost to the municipality. So we're really pleased to have him amongst our, amongst our ranks. Uh, he will be serving Northeast Nova, as well as other parts of the province. But uh, he'll be doing his day-to-day -day work out of our office, so you can imagine any calls for service that uh, perhaps would be too small normally for a dog to attend, uh, he'll be happy to jump in and help our members. So that's, uh, that's gonna be a real win for us. The admin position uh, that we're working on, the, uh, there's, we're at the MOU mem uh, memorandum, memorandum of understanding between DOJ and the municipality at this point. So we're expecting that to move along and uh, hopefully get staffed within the very near future. respect to our operations, uh, for community policing, Constable Forward has been working very diligently. He's been out uh, meeting with different businesses around the municipality, focusing on uh, Business Watch as well as ensuring that they know that he's, uh, he's a liaison between them and the police if they have any uh, questions or concerns. Uh, he's also working very hard to reestablish the crime prevention. As you know that uh, COVID was, uh, was a real kicker for everyone over the last couple of years. Uh, our crime prevention volunteers um, are as susceptible as anyone to, uh, to COVID-19, and so meetings were, uh, were few, but they've definitely picked up. So for uh, our East Coast Crime Prevention, a couple of things they have lined up right away is the Seniors Police Academy. That is something that we had mentioned previously, but again, COVID continued to push it back. But we're now online for September 14th. It's going to run six weeks out of Nine Mile River, 25 people per class, and uh, it'll have a variety of helpful sessions, things like Alzheimer care, wanderer care, wanderer support. Uh, we'll have ground search and rescue to come in. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, affairs with respect to estate. Uh, the pharmacist is gonna come in and do a presentation on medication and those types of things, how to protect your medication from illicit use by others perhaps, or how to properly dispose your medication, as well as frauds and scams and, and much more. And if that works out well, then the next session is gonna be planned for Mount Uniac. We're also working hard on uh, Citizens on Patrol recruitment, and that leads us into the, uh, our open house that we have, uh, crime prevention has, uh, for June 8th. And the poster for that is, is posted above, and of course, everybody is welcome to attend. We've been looking uh, specifically for representatives yourselves, uh, from the different communities to come in and, and hear about what crime prevention is doing and how we can collectively work to, uh, to make East Hans a safer place to live. So with our uh, continuing with our operations, the uh, our calls for service remain steady and uh, they are on the increase with the warm weather. Yesterday, for example, we had 17 calls for service. That's a lot uh, normally for, our, for and that's just during the day shift. So for our members, that's, uh, they're going basically call to call to call. Uh, that is, uh, that's typical uh, in East Hance um, from time to time, uh, but it's not, it's not a sustained uh, pace that we're used to, but it happens definitely from time to time but yesterday was definitely a busy day. Key areas of concern, and uh, we'll see a little bit of this on our next slide, but uh, mental health calls continue to be uh, a key area of concern. Motor vehicle collisions and crashes, and uh, we're currently working with one of the traffic analysts who uh, is under the umbrella of traffic services for the province, and asking her to do a bit of an, a deep dive into our calls for our calls about uh, aggressive driving, where those are taking place, the nature of uh, the nature of the calls, or that they're that they're and the behaviors that's being observed, and where these collisions are taking place, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, get her to map the areas, map perhaps the predictive behaviors that we can interdict and uh, and get a better handle because our our crashes, uh, and you'll see on the next slide. Uh, and uh, aggressive driving complaints are, are on the rise. 
and that leads into the traffic offenses. It's getting very busy, uh, you know, in the corridor area, a lot more traffic, a lot more people. Uh, it's getting busy and that is uh, generating a lot more calls for service that are traffic related. And then last but not least, thefts. Thefts seem to be up, um, minor thefts, gas and go thefts, um, break and enters, which result in theft. These are the types of things that seem to be on the rise. On our next slide, I'll let you take a look at that and absorb some of the information. Again, I'll draw your attention to crashes, collisions, traffic offenses, thefts, um, wellness checks, mental health. These are the types of things that uh, are continuing to, uh, to cause us some concern. And again, for orientation purposes, the numbers for this quarter are calls since our last meeting, and then the three-year average are the numbers for the same time period, and it's the average of 2019, 2020, 2021. I hope we're perusing this all, not going to a dead silence. <laughs> so I'll take any questions, if anyone has any, or comments. Any questions, Councillor Perry? Thank you, Mr. Chair, through, through you, the RCP. Thank, thank you and welcome for coming again today. Um, I've been receiving some phone calls uh, from some residents. Uh, they're seeing up cars being broken into in their driveways um, it seems like it's this time of year that that seems to uptick every year uh, I was just wondering if you guys have noticed any trends um, of that starting to pick up again in uh, the last number of weeks absolutely uh, that would be covered under mischief if you look at the mischief numbers there uh, 61 is our calls for service for mischief during the last quarter the average of the last three years uh, is 29 so there has been a a bit of an uptick in our in our mischief but that mischief could relate to any nature damage to property as well as disturbance of someone's lawful enjoyment of their property loud music middle of the night right. that would also be classified as mischief uh, but definitely uh what you're talking about is covered under those numbers okay no i just wanted to make sure that they were pro properly being reported because sometimes they call me and they don't call you and i always uh, <laughs> tell them to make yeah. sure you call and let the rcmp know that uh that this that this event has happened most in most cases it's just some change or a few things missing from the inside of their car but uh i just uh, thought it was pertinent to make sure that that was known that uh, there seems to be an uptake happening especially in it seems to even be going outside of the most common areas of the bigger subdivisions on some of the smaller private roads and stuff it's also uh, seems to be occurring at all councillor Perry? yes that's all thank you thank you uh deputy warden mitchell Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a few questions through to uh, the officers. Does your thefts include shoplifting? Yes. Uh, so that would be under the minor, the thefts under. And if you look at theft under, theft over. So the 43 is the theft under. That would be the shoplifting, more or less, unless it was shoplifting of a really expensive item. And uh, compared to the previous uh, three quarters, 27. So there's been a there's been an uptick in there. Gas and goes would be covered under that. Uh, they're generally under five thousand dollars, so you would uh, you would have that covered under there as well. So there's been, see there's not a huge jump in the, the theft over, but the theft under definitely took a took an uptick. Could you give me an example of a mischief charge? Uh, a, a basic damage to property. Um, someone destroyed another person's mailbox. Uh, 
Um, that would be mischief. Someone vandalized someone's car, that would be mischief. Spray painting on a wall, um, any damage to property, basically. Also, uh, as it relates to enjoyment of someone's property, if, if because of your behavior or because of something you've done, uh, you, have, you have disrupted the enjoyment of someone else's property or prohibited them from enjoying their property, that would also be mischief. Uh, say, for example, someone has a cottage and it's adjacent your land and then you fell trees across their driveway so they can't get to their cottage. That would be classified as mischief, right? You're, you're in obstructing them from enjoying their property, uh, getting the full use of their property or, you know, extremely uh, obnoxious or loud noise, music, something like that late at night um, when most people are trying to enjoy rest and relaxation, that would be classified as mischief. We always try to deal with these things at the lowest level possible, find a resolution or a solution, um, but it could end up in a, in a charge. Could you give me an example of a warning if it's not a mischief charge? A warning? Yes. Um, I think say something that's low level, particularly where the, the victim or complainant uh, doesn't necessarily wish to see charges laid, we would, uh, we would seek some kind of resolution, be it perhaps with the tree example, removal of the trees immediately, um, turning the, the music off or down. Uh, we would just look to cease the behavior and then, you know, a promise that it wouldn't, that it would not continue. Um, if there was damage to property and, and the, the person who's responsible made a, an agreement with the victim to repay or to in some way uh, provide compensation, that would be something also that we could do. Um, we're not in the business necessarily of collecting bills or forcing people to do these things, but if we can deal with it at the lowest level possible and facilitate two people working it out, then that's a good thing. We'll, we'll help to facilitate, um, but it's, it's hard for police to enforce some, an action like that. And the last part deals with the mental health. Um, with articles in the newspaper and on the news, I'm just curious to see how the mental health of our officers is doing and you can elaborate as much as you feel free. Thank you. Um, that, that is of, of, uh, of great concern uh, for myself, for Martin, for, for everyone that works at our unit as well as our, throughout the RCMP in Nova Scotia and, and Canada. Um, there is a lot of stuff that's happening in the news that, 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 causes, that causes us concern for our members' mental health and wellness. Um, we take pride in our, in our work, we take pride in each other, take pride in ourselves, and when we hear that people are displeased with our, with our, action, our actions or our level of service, that, that has an impact. Um, people are impacted because of feelings of, of inadequacy or perhaps survivor's guilt. Uh, there's a lot of officers that are gravely impacted by that. They feel like they wish they could have or would have done more or even been present. Officers in different parts of the province or perhaps different parts of the country are feeling awful at this time because they wish they could have been there to help or do more. Um, so it does have an impact. And uh, you know, beyond that, it has a grave impact on a lot of our, a lot of our families, a lot of our spouses, uh, members' wives and, and husbands that are sitting at home watching the news. They're feeling this as well. Um, so, and general public too, like uh, people have pride in their police and, they have, and they have friends and neighbors that are police officers. So when these things are in the news, I think it, uh, I think it has a negative impact on everyone. Uh, the MCC is there to find the truth. Um, they're there to provide recommendations on how to do things better. Uh, I think we all know that ultimately uh, the horrific events that occurred were the, were the, uh, you know, the sole uh, responsibility of one evil individual. Um, but we all want to be able to respond in a better way. We all want to be able to stop the pain quicker. We all want to be able to find a solution that's, that's most effective. And, um, you, know, that's, uh, you know, that is difficult on our members. Um, through um, probably the thing that is causing the most distress is, um, you know, to pardon the cliche, but the armchair quarterbacking of efforts that were made, you know, during and after the event. Um, all I can say from my chair is the, my colleagues that were responsible for responding that night and, and in the days after were doing their utmost. There, there's nobody that wasn't providing 100% uh, of what they believed they were able to give and, and do. Um, 
you know, nobody pulled any punches when it came to uh, when it came to providing the best support that they could or the best efforts that they could. Um, just in some cases, we uh, didn't have the information that was required in the moment or perhaps decisions that were made um, in hindsight um, could have been made differently. That's like anything else, but it does weigh heavily. So thank you for the question and uh, forgive the long elaboration, um, but it is something that uh, we all take seriously um, and uh, it's close at heart. Um, our members have access, if you're concerned or, or have questions, our members do have access to extensive supports, uh, both through professional mental health and, uh, and non-professional um, services. Uh, there's, there is a lot of support out there and, and a lot of services that can be brought to bear and is being brought to bear for, for the support of our members and our extended families. Um, not, that the, not that I'm not concerned about, about uh, our people, gravely concerned. Um, but I, I have confidence that for those who wish to partake or those who wish to avail of services, they are available. Thank you for your comments. That's all, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Deputy Warden. Next up would be uh, Public Member Randall. Just bring the mic down in front. It's not working? It's on, but... Okay, you'll have to guess you'll have to speak in a live voice. There it is. And uh, I'll be I'll be sort of talking off the cuff with that one. It's it's really the the initiative um, of crime prevention. So I'm speaking on their behalf a little bit. I'm sure some of those metrics will be you know do we have a great attendance? Is there a is there a waiting list of people that that also wish to attend but weren't able to get into those 25 spots? Um, I'm sure there'll be a, an evaluation of sorts and uh, through you chair of course. Sorry to be turning my my yeah, head, um, but. Um, there will be uh, there'll be some kind of a you know maybe a questionnaire at the end you know how did you enjoy this was it was it helpful what sessions would you like to see included what sessions would you like to see removed that type of thing um, but uh, that I'm again speaking on behalf of crime prevention but I'm quite confident that there'll be uh, there'll be a bit of a follow up assessment or ongoing assessment through the process just to just to gauge uh, how receptive people are um, it's meant to be it's meant to be informative. Uh, but it's also meant to be a little bit fun and whimsical too. It's not, uh, it's not a serious thing in the sense that um, we want people to, uh, you know, to be there with a furrow brow and, you know, the study time. No, it's, let's get together. Let's enjoy this. We'll have some great information, perhaps make some community connections. Uh, so it's, uh, I think just getting together is going to be a win. Um, I'm, I'm confident it's going gonna, it's gonna to be successful no matter how it turns out. Uh, there's going to be degrees of success. Is that all public member Randall? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Next up, uh, Warden Rolson. Thank you. Um, just a quick question. Um, staff shortages. Um, are we short any administrative detachment assistance? Uh, we have one shortage at this time. That leads to question two. How is that impacting the Rodden office for which I'm getting the call saying, you know, um, have so the hours changed there? No, 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 they have, <clears throat> excuse me, they have not. Um, so our Rodden office member has not been affected by the, the, the uh, there is a gap in the Enfield office. It has not, that gap has not affected this, I'll speak of East Hans Enfield for a moment, um, hasn't affected service delivery there in, this, in the, in this, in the uh, terms of uh, the hours that we operate and those types of things. It does create a little extra pressure on the, on the DSAs that are working. They have a little extra work to do to, uh, to fill that gap. Um, however, with Rodden, she remains somewhat distinct from, from okay. Enfield and, and what's going on there. Do we uh, forward our phones to Rodden to pick up those phone calls when East Hans Enfield is on break or lunch and no one else is available? Absolutely. A lot of mutual support going on. Um, with respect to our, our, uh, our Rodden member, 
uh, she does have um, she does have leave like we all do, and so I know recently she's taken a lot of leave. Um, so that's probably having Im an impact, or it's, it's feeling she's feeling you know the community is feeling that, and um, so that's uh, you know that's what I would suggest is happening at this moment. Is she's taking she's taking okay. some leave. Well, I know has. everyone has vacation and leave of that's various right. various types, but in the past. Um, the member who was in Rawdon was moved to cover in Enfield, and it was a very long time before people realized that it happened. So I just wanted to uh, feel that out now because, uh, you know, I'll, I'll get the comments and questions. You know, have we? Is the office closed again, or uh, mm -hmm. are we down? So I can just quite honestly say, no, um, I, I'm not aware of vacation schedules and whatnot, but we're fully staffed and ready to go thank you no you're um, welcome and we've we've asked uh, jackie to uh if as, as best as she can to forecast when she's going to be there mm -hmm. and put that and she's very good she's lot, very good at putting a note on the door too if yeah will actually the window actually go up and read it and <laughs> yeah let people know oops my apologies is that all too that's there? it uh, yeah <laughs> next up uh council Councillor Garden Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, through you, I'm just looking at these numbers, and I know it's uh, two years into a pandemic and all the stresses and uh, the outcomes that are uh, arising because of that. Would you say these are all-time high numbers or off mm. the cuff? That's that's a hard one to uh, to say if they're all-time high. I mean, if you look at our total calls for service versus uh, you know for this quarter versus the the previous. You know, there's quite a there's quite a jump in in total calls for service. I, I I we haven't really done that super duper right. deep deep dive. I would like to th to think that this is a this is a you know an artifact of the growing population. This is just a normal organic right. just thing. COVID absolutely is is having impact. Um, people are stressed by home prices. They're stressed by grocery and fuel prices. Um, that's that's going to impact all a lot of these numbers. You know, right. people are driving more aggressively because they're frustrated or they're angry or they're in a rush. Um, people are resorting to perhaps theft of gas or theft of minor things. We've had a a real run on thefts at the liquor store. Um, that's a let's face it, it's a common coping mechanism, and uh, some people are are not perhaps, I'm guessing here, but perhaps not able to, uh, to afford uh, the, the liquor for consumption and so they're stealing it. Um, you know, we had three thefts in one day just recently and uh, major thefts like to the tune of, uh, you know, over a thousand dollars for one and, uh, but they're, they're going in and filling up the a grocery bag and or a knapsack and scooting out the door. So, um, I think that's why, and hopefully we'll be able to, um, we'll be we'll be able to talk and have great conversation about this during our crime prevention meeting. But uh, I think a lot of these issues, um, the harm's been done if police are called, right? Like we've once once it becomes a statistic for us, there's already been an impact, a negative impact on the community or on victims or on businesses and. And hopefully through crime prevention, we can start to dig a little bit out the root causes of some of these things and put and, and look at ways that we can uh, invoke community-based supports that will perhaps avoid this. Um, I don't have all the answers, but we have tons of very talented people within our municipality, citizens, um, residents that, that do have skills and abilities to see the root causes or or to understand when people are struggling and maybe know mm -hmm. ways to, to support and help that might prevent a theft or prevent a mental health breakdown or prevent, you know, someone driving aggressively. Um, so that's, that's kind of the hope. Right. That's where we want to go with that. Um, a trend that I guess uh, you hope won't, uh, won't be maintained for sure, those numbers. Um, the other thing is uh, the programs that you have, you know, the Seniors Police Academy, things like that. Do you find that, I know that member morale is vital uh, in 2022, uh, more mm -hmm. so than any other time in history, probably. Do you find that programs like that 
uh, boost the morale of, of uh, members. I remember, you know, one of my kids being involved in a, a bicycle event at the RCMP station, which was so awesome, you know, mm -hmm. uh, things like that that bring the, uh, the, the residents and members together. Do you find that that's uh, something that members, you know, appreciate or that they, uh, that it's helpful to them in that way? Um, I, I, I think it's very helpful and forgive me, Chair, I think it's through you. I have a hard time not looking over, but it's, um, I think it's very helpful for our members. Like any positive interaction our members get to have with the community is always rewarding, is always fulfilling. That's why all of us joined was to be helpful and to engage in positive ways with the people that we live and support with and live with and support. And uh, it's, it's, it's great to do those things. Uh, I will be honest, when three members yesterday were battling 17 calls for service in an eight hour period, Corey coming to them and saying, hey, would you mind going to the school and doing a bike right. rodeo in the middle of a day like that? That's a bit of a pull, you know what I mean? Like it's, that's, that's stressful. Um, that sort of, that drains all the fun out of, out of that activity. Right. So um, we, to the best of our ability, try to schedule those special events at times when we know we have sufficient officers on or the people that we get engaged um, are members that we know are gonna be relatively unencumbered from other duties, just mm -hmm. so it will be more fun. Right. But uh, you're absolutely right. It's, uh, it's great when our members, <coughs> and, and some, of the, some of the best work comes out of those positive interactions and that really boosts the member spirit and, and uh, gets them more engaged and, and, uh, and helps them to, uh, to take a lot more pride in what they're doing. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Next up would be Councillor Eli Musa. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Corey, I, I know you have been busy in Mount Uniac in this month, so it's, it's not in this report yet, and uh, I was very, very happy to see like how many RCMP we get when the accident at Withrow, like they were flying like crazy, like they were doing a good job too. But uh, I have another question about the business park. Mm -hmm. It seems it seems like the converter stolen from the cars seems to die down over the winter or over like six month period and they're now coming back. Did you happen to catch anybody doing that over there or they're taking a break and coming back now? So. Um, we've definitely had some success in identifying other jurisdictions have, have laid charges against some individuals. Um, I, I'm just taking a bit of a jump here in that it's usually the same people, not the same people every time, but if you have a run of thefts of catalytic converters, it's probably a group or an individual that is just on a run and they're, they're doing you know, a series of thefts and, and having success and making money at it and that's why they keep going. Um, our SKU teams, as well as SKU teams of other jurisdictions, they're, uh, they're always tracking these individuals and trying to, to find out where they're, they're hitting next. And uh, there has been success with charges. It's, uh, it's lucrative, it's easy. Um, if a vehicle's unattended, uh, it's easy for someone to slip under it, under the cloak of darkness and, and take a converter. So uh, it's probably a crime that will uh, that'll continue. Um, it's, it's a difficult one to interdict. Um, target hardening, making it difficult for thieves to steal, putting your vehicles under light, behind barricades. These are the types of things that will help protect particularly businesses in the business park. We've had a lot of hits at the business park lately. Um, there's been, uh, you know, there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of theft. Proximity to the city is a hard one. Um, any, any, jur any business jurisdictions that are in proximity to a large population are always going to be more susceptible to, uh, to thefts because a lot of these types of crimes, if it's not a person's crime, um, are gen generally thefts of opportunity, you know, thefts, crimes of opportunity rather, thefts, um, frauds, these types of things, like people, people will perpetrate them when it's convenient, when it's easy. And uh, it's always easier to, to perpetrate these crimes when you don't have to work too hard to do it. And you don't have to drive too far when you don't have to work too hard. Um, that's, uh, that's what we see with, with those types of things. So the business parks that are in proximity to, um, to larger populations are always gonna be hit a little harder. Um, Terry Fogarty, our crime prevention or community policing officer has made a 
couple of rounds through the park, handing out his business card, talking to business owners about target hardening, about how they can protect themselves a little better, how they can coordinate amongst themselves to do a bit of a business watch. Uh, these are some proactive things that, that are, that are uh, being done in the park. Um, it's um, it, uh, something that they can do amongst themselves is, uh, is perhaps look at, um, look at private security. Um, that's an option, per, albeit it comes with a cost. I will tell you one thing that uh, that is a mutual support to all of them, and we've leveraged this to the max. A lot of them have very good um, high definition security cameras, and there's sufficient people or businesses in the park that have high definition cameras that if this business is hit and they don't have a camera, the one on either side probably do. And so we've been able to get a lot of evidence from the benefit of, of other people's uh, security devices and their cameras particularly. And they're all high def, a lot of them are high, high definition now. And uh, that's, uh, that's, been, uh, that's been good for us. So a bit of a, you know, a, a kudos to the, the business owners that are being proactive in that way. It's a shame that anyone has to go to that expense to fortify their, their, their properties. Um, but I will say it, it is help, it's helpful. It, uh, it does help. Yeah, uh, I, I know they came, you guys came to my business and probably caught somebody from my camera, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was someone I know and it wasn't good. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you. Uh, You're welcome. And all, Councilor Musa? Yes, thank you. Seeing no one left on my screen, I'd like to turn the chair over to the warden, if she would. Uh, Staff Sergeant, you, uh, you touched on it a little bit with the gas prices going up. And I know we're just entering the summer season, but long trend in this, where they don't see these gas prices returning to, we'll say, normal values for quite some time. And I assume that we are uh, looking down the road to the fall winter zone that, okay, that having the assumption that these uh, thefts of gas and, and, and small petty theft crimes may you know, will probably most likely increase due to the fact of of trying people just trying to get by and, and, and turn into desperate measures. So I assume that you're, you know, taking that into consideration when the if these gas prices continue the way they're going right there. We do. Um, and gas and gas and goes in particular <clears throat> are are challenging for police um, because it's 100% preventable. Um, all, all gas stations now have the capability to, to have pay at the pump or to have prepay before you pay before you pump. People can go into the store and, uh, and prepay. Um, it, um, it is 100% preventable. We would like to see the, the gas industry take more steps to protect themselves in that regard and, um, and to enforce a, a prepay program. It eliminates it 100%. Well, I guess I know I understand what you're saying with regard to the gas and goes, yes. But I, I, what I'm concerned about is is the theft of gas from vehicles in people's yards. Oh, yes. The theft of the possibility, the greater possibility of theft from oil barrels that are, you know, will be, a, a, they'll be there next fall if these prices don't, don't, don't move. So I just want to make sure that you're, mm -hmm. uh, you're aware that this is, this is going to increase. Right, and it's going to put a lot of pressure on a lot of people. So that was just kind of an assumption. No, it's uh, a, that's 100% accurate, and uh, especially fuel oil. Um, people don't necessarily have to have gas in the tank, but they have to have a warm home in the winter time. So, exactly. you know, it's uh, that would be. And what I haven't heard talked about uh, here today, I, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's not your fault. With regard to the drug scene, where where do we stand with, with that? I know there's probably not a lot that you can tell me, but I want to be prob I want to be assured that this is uh, being seriously you know taken and it's a continual uh, uh, investigation because uh, what I'm hearing out there is a lot of hardcore drugs that are entering here, a lot more people that may be bootlegging drugs, you know, out there. So. Um, Tell me what you can with regard to uh, the drug scene. 
just making the note chair. Uh, so um, drug enforcement is absolutely a, you know an ongoing, ever-present priority for, for police. Um, people that are living off the avails of drug sales, they're basically living you know, off the pain and suffering of others. Uh, we have zero tolerance or patience for people that are peddling drugs. It's something that we take super seriously. Um, <coughs> our SKU team is almost 100% devoted to drug enforcement, like that's the bulk of their work. They do do other things, of course, <clears throat> um, but uh, but that's uh, you know that that's a, a big a big pressure. Um, so we work collaboratively with other SKU agencies, street crime ag uh, units throughout the province, uh, sharing information. A lot of these people are interconnected. People that are selling drugs in our communities uh, are very much interconnected. They have to uh, you know they have to they have to share stock. They have to trade money. They have to you know, uh, have like-minded associates. So we're always sharing that information uh, and looking for uh, the best ways to, to, uh, to interdict as well as charge. Um, sometimes a, uh, you know, an interdiction is, is as effective as, as laying a criminal charge. Um, so we, uh, you know, we take every opportunity we can to do that. And uh, we, hope to, we hope to bring you some, some news, you know, in the not too distant future of of more seizures and, and uh, charges in that regard. Um, you know, for those that are, for those that are uh, gonna be, you know, watching this presentation uh, from our communities, um, we like to hear from people that are in the know. If, if anyone has information they'd like to share with police, they can always contact uh, our office or they can call Crime Stoppers, uh, which is 100% confidential and, uh, and share information. So we're, uh, we're always willing to do that. But to your point, and to your question, uh, yeah, it's a it's an ongoing and ever present pressure for us. Well, I thank you for the reassurance on that. That's all from me there, Warden. Thank you. All right, I have uh, Councillor Michael Perry. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair of the RCMP. Um, a couple points brought up here got me thinking, and, and one of the things before you talked about the growing community, um, all the areas of East Hants and every district are growing and changing. Um, whether it's parents moving away, children taking over their homes, large subdivisions going in, uh, a lot of influx of, of different people from different backgrounds. With that comes a change in obviously policing strategies and the, the awareness that things are going, are going to change. What kind of um, lessons learned have you taken from, I know your members have come from a variety of different backgrounds and a variety of different experiences dealing with communities that are very similar to ours that are growing, some that have grown and stagnated in different areas. What kind of things have you guys been able to kind of sandbox of how things are gonna kind of go forward? Because there is quite a few developments happening. There is gonna be some more dense, denser population and, and, dense, and density then sometimes creates conflict or creates different things. So there, the, the current policing strategies that we've used in East Hans for a number of years, um, obviously, change and adapt with that, but looking to be proactive, what, what is your kind of vision going forward? No, thank you uh, for the question and, and through you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> that's, uh, that's something that's definitely on our mind. There's a number of things that sort of that jump to mind. When you talk about population density and, and how that changes how we police, if you would have looked at the policing maps and the, uh, the analysts that I referred to earlier, who's going to be plotting some of the some of the crimes that we've been experiencing and looking to help us anticipate what things are going to be coming forward. I've already received a little bit of material from that person. And you can already see that there's it's just peppered along the corridor of incidents and reports of of aggressive driving, for example, or impaired driving, that type of thing. Well, there's where that's where the 102 is. That's where Highway 2 is. Uh, the other uh, high density area is the number one highway going through Mount Uniac. And then for the rest of the jurisdiction, just a scant little speckle of, of calls for service here and there. So looking forward as our population does seem to does grow, um, you can probably anticipate that we'll be putting officers where the calls for service are. So that can, 
they can uh, they can uh, respond rapidly and, and be as effective as possible. That always has to be balanced with getting into the communities, being being rural, being connected. That'll never change, um, but probably a more deliberate part of our strategy will be, look, here, here we know we're gonna get 75% of the calls for service today, so be, be in proximity, but continue to get out. So we, we can anticipate that. Also with the super dense uh, population growth that's coming, and particularly through, uh, you know, from along Highway 2, from Elmsdale to Robert Scott Drive and Lance, with all those subdivisions, we don't have a bike patrol right now. But once all those all the infrastructure gets in place, it's going to be, there's going to be connectivity through the whole thing, through trails and, and, and secondary roads and so on and so forth. That'd be a great place for us to, 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 to put a bike patrol in. I've already procured two bicycles. We have a couple of trained members. We probably need to get more. Um, so once, you know, once we start to see the connectivity that uh, will justify putting a couple members on a bicycle for the day, That'll be a great way to get out in the community and do some different, a different type of enforcement that we haven't been able to do in East Hans previously. Um, and you can see why. Ge ge geographically, it's not, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to put someone on a bicycle and roll up Mount, you know, through Highway 1 of Mount Uniac. Just not going to, you know, you, you, you wouldn't see too many people. Yeah, it's pretty dangerous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's dangerous too. So, um, but those are the types of things that come to mind right off the top. Um, more robust community interaction, uh, more robust uh, crime prevention initiatives in these in these in these growing areas. With more population comes more talent, more people to contribute. Also, with greater population, sometimes that can can come with uh, you know with more with more challenges. Um, we'll be uh, you know we're we're open to facing those challenges. Uh, the chair has has talked before about. Uh, you know about our our uh, the way that we work, and uh, you know how we can be be strategic with our uh, you know with the number of police officers that are working at different times of the day. We can adjust that as well, and uh, you know put more people during certain hours and, and less during others. That may have to change depending on the numbers and the activities that's taking place. Uh, you can appreciate with uh, with the huge influx of people. Um, rush hour on either end of the day might become a real traffic concern that we need to saturate with officers. Um, our provincial traffic unit will probably be a big part of that plan. And, um, but that's something that we can probably anticipate. If there's not a lot of new businesses coming up in East Hans, then many of these people may be commuting to, uh, to work. So that's, that's a thought that comes to mind. So um, having said all that, we're always open to hearing what your suggestions are, or the suggestions of your your, your colleagues uh, on and things that they anticipate, new industries that are coming, um, new pressures that they anticipate are coming. We'd like to hear about it so that we can start thinking and, and start putting uh, putting plans in place. Thank you. No, you actually took my second point. My second point was going to be about active transportation and how to engage in active transportation. So the bike patrol definitely uh, is something that I was uh, looking at. And the last thing I have. Um, as springtime comes, we've, we've now switched from snowmobile to off-road vehicles. <laughs> um, and there are a lot of new people in our communities that um, aren't used to a rural aspect of understanding that people have off-road vehicles and use them. Uh, I've been receiving lots of calls uh, from some people asking why people are allowed to drive their vehicles. And I said they're accessing a trail from here to here. And a lot of people didn't know there was trails there. But there are, but there are the, the few that uh, are out stunting. And, uh, and driving excessively through, through some subdivisions. Um, is there any type of plan for, enforcement's very difficult because if they start to run, then it becomes a safety hazard. I 100% get that. But an, an educational piece, um, especially geared around uh, some, some engaging with the youth, uh, mm -hmm. it seems to be those between 12 and, and 17 seem to be the ones that uh, have the most brazen, uh, uh, enthusiasm to try things that may or may not be unsafe, whether it be in a subdivision or along the number one in my community, and I would imagine it's happening in other communities as well. Um, and and some of this for some new residents and even some longtime residents is uh, is concerning. Yes, and um, social media is not helping either. Um, some of these young people that you speak of are 
trying to outdo each other on social media with videos of stunting and videos of other uh, high risk activity with uh, off road vehicles and it it uh, provides great entertainment but it's uh, it's absolutely terrifying for those that are in the community and observing it um, and it's also dangerous uh, it puts these people in great risk and and potentially great risk to those around them so um, to to answer your question we it's it's top of mind the problems with with uh, ATVs and and it is a small group of riders in East Hans area that is that is causing the, the most concern um, we have a huge population of ATV users in East Hans and uh, the majority of people are responsible ATV users and uh, and they follow the law and we don't receive calls or concerns about these people it's just a few um, it's uh, you know honestly we don't have we don't have any proactive programs in place at this time um, we do our regular patrols we do have um, we do have a, a business case in uh, requesting two ATVs for our office we currently don't have ATVs but we have uh, a business case put forward to the province to get two ATVs that we can use for more patro proactive patrols um, we'll see we'll see where that goes and uh, we also have a trainer within our office right now that is has the capability to provide training to our members uh, in ATV enforcement. So these are the things that we're, we're slowly working toward. Uh, in a pinch, we can solicit the use of ATVs from other jurisdictions. Um, and uh, I've got the cooperation of other commanders in the province that if we need ATVs, we can go borrow theirs. Uh, that That is uh, available to us at this time. But uh, no, when it, when it comes to education, and those types of programs, it's um, we um, we don't have anything in the place at this time. I would love to hear from uh, you know at Vans or or perhaps engage with them on on how we could collaborate on on an initiative like that. Get their thoughts on on the best way to uh, you know to sort of penetrate that population and 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 get the word out. Albeit, it's not lost on me that most of the people that are part of that at Vans are probably our law-abiding. Uh, you know, <coughs> respectful riders anyway. But I would, uh, you know, and Councillor Hebb, I know that you and your son are involved. So uh, we would be, um, we, we would love to engage a little bit more. Um, it's it's a tough one though. It's, yep. uh, <laughs> I think you hit the nail on the head. Like the majority of residents of East Hans that have an off-road vehicle drive them very responsibly. Mm -hmm. um, I see them all, I see them every day. They drive past my house, connecting to different trails and and you know they slow down our my roads a slower speed uh they watch out for children they're very respectful there is a small group um the only thing i might suggest is as part of the the, the school liaison um just when they're in the schools um just kind of enforcing it to to the younger kids between the ages of 12 and up even though they're supposed to be 16 to operate most of these vehicles you go most areas people have been driving them since they were seven eight nine years old so um just kind of reinforcing the safety side aspect of it as part of the community connectivity in the schools might um, might be great. And of course, I would fully support, you know, any type of uh, cooperation with Ativans or any other off-road vehicle group, uh, I think would work very well. But for the majority of people, yes, law abiding, very well done. It is, the, it, it is that uh, small group that also causes the most damage too. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Perry. Seeing no one else, um... Staff Sergeant, do you have a specialized services list, some kind of report on that? I do. Discussion point? Um, so what, I have a couple more things, and there's one thing I left off the agenda, and I, or left off my, um, yeah, my, my agenda, and, and I'd like to talk at the end, but if we want to take a, a look at the next slide there, Nova Scotia Chief of the okay, Police Before we get into that, Deputy oh. Warden, uh, forgive me. Th through you, Mr. Chair, I was uh, looking at the specialized service support, and because I have grandchildren, Two of them stuck out to me, and I just want to see if you could give a comment on. Sure. The first one is human trafficking unit, and the second one next to it is the Internet Child Expor Exportation Unit. Uh, can you do you see an uptake uh, across the province, or? Uh, so, in a nutshell, yes. Um, the a lot of these things are 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 rooted in, or excuse me, the the way that they're facilitated is rooted in technology um, through Snapchat and, and some of these some of these other uh, some of these other 
popular uh, social media programs, a lot of these predators will use these platforms to identify, to connect with potential victims. Um, it's human trafficking is 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 a real problem in in lots of jurisdictions. Nova Scotia is uh, Nova Scotia is is not uh, is not unique, and we're definitely not immune. Um, any youth that is at risk is a target for human trafficking, and um, these perpetrators are uh, they're experts at identifying young people that are that are in need, that are suffering, that lack attention or love and they are they are finely tuned at providing what these young people need to track them attract them into the game and uh, of human trafficking and then and then exploit them so as parents and this is something that our school liaison officer talks to our youth about quite often he does many presentations on on internet threats and threats and dangers it's a little later on the human trafficking side of things, obviously with the younger grades, but he talks a lot about the dangers of the internet and the dangers that, that, that are out there and how, how to protect yourself when you're online and so on and so forth. <clears throat> but uh, these are specialized units that, that are working to, to uh, basically rescue victims and to prevent those that we know that are going down that road from, from, from falling prey or falling victim. It's, uh, it's, it's a real challenging craft, and uh, the reason being is because we have victims that are susceptible and vulnerable, and, and then perpetrators that are, that are capitalizing on that. And um, it's hard for a police officer to go to someone who's, who's a victim or who's vulnerable and convince them that this guy or girl or whoever that's providing all kinds of wanted attention is a bad person you know and uh, I've heard many stories of officers that have tried to interdict with young people to get turned away you know the young person doesn't want the help this is the first person that's paid attention to me in a long time or you know this this person's kind and loving and caring of me where I don't have that in my in my normal life and uh, so it's it's a hard job for a police officer to to uh, to convince a young person that they're they're actually being groomed for trafficking or that they're susceptible to, to, to grave danger. Um, but those units that you speak of, they're highly trained in that craft. All of our members have an awareness, all of our members work to prevent it. Um, the members in these units are specialists in this, in this uh, craft. They know, they know the, the, the perpetrators, they know, the, uh, you know how, how the perpetrators operate and, uh, and they're, they're doing a lot of work to uh, to interdict and to bring people like that to justice. They support our members. If we get a, a complaint of human trafficking, we can call to these units to help give us the support we need to, to follow through to, a, to a, a, a good, happy conclusion. Thank you, that's all, Mr. Chair. Uh, can you, Corey, you wanna continue on there and speak boot? Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, I just bring this to your attention because it's something that may or may not be, you know, uh, you know, within your, you know, within the news you're reading or, or something you may have heard about. But I just want to dispel perhaps some any any myths that may be out there. Um, and as with respect to a, a recent vote that happened within the Association of Chiefs of Police, and so I'll back that up. The Association of Chiefs of Police, and forgive me, I'm going to read this uh, as representation at the executive leadership level from. All municipal police services, the RCP, the military police, and other uh, agencies throughout Nova Scotia. Members of the association represent interests of the Nova Scotia police community on many uh, committees at the local, provincial, and national level. So this is a collaboration of chiefs of police, a collaboration of all these leaders with all these policing organizations that talk about problems, perhaps like human trafficking in the province of Nova Scotia, uh, perhaps like cybercrime and these types of things. And they would talk about strategies, like provincially, how much money do we want from the province to go toward human trafficking or to go toward this or go toward that? Or what's the provincial priority going to be for this type of policing? So they would collaborate on these things. Recently, the association has voted to redesignate the RCMP to associate status, basically a non-voting member. So as you can appreciate, the RCMP is the biggest policing provider in Nova Scotia. We are Nova Scotia's provincial police force. 
and now we've been relegated to uh, you know, an associate status within this, this important body. Um, it, uh, it's contrary to some of the objectives that uh, have been put forth by the Justice Minister. Every year the Justice Minister will give his marching orders to policing associations and to police departments like the RCMP across the province and, and uh, it filters down to people like myself. You know, these are the expectations. We, and they say things like, we want you to hammer human trafficking. You know, we want you to, we want you to make that a priority. Um, and we anticipate or we suspect that perhaps this was in response to efforts to enact the provincial police standards and modernize policing. And as, as we are the RCMP and we are a very big organization, we do have um, access to all those policing services which I've shared in that, uh, in that attachment. Um, not every agency has access to those. And under, under the, the Police Act, Every municipality is charged with the responsibility of providing policing services to their residents, and they have to do so at a certain standard. And so establishing these standards has not been, that's not the RCMP's drive. However, it's something that the MCC that's going on right now um, and, uh, and other reviews around the province, they're looking to establish, you know, what, what should the policing standards look like? We are in favor of that, so we are, we are we are not the driver behind it, but we're definitely in favor of it. And we've been vocal about being in favor of it. Of course, it paints the RCMP in a good light because we have the highest standard in a lot of these cases. We have access to some of the best services and the best training around. So we, we suspect that perhaps one of the reasons we've been uh, you know, voted out is because we're pushing for this higher degree of standard. And um, that does that will not be beneficial for some of these smaller departments that don't have access to these to these services. And I should I should actually correct that and say they all have access, but perhaps at a cost, right? If they need to get a police dog, they may have to pay for that. Or if they need to get you know human trafficking services, they may have to they may have to pay for that in some way. So it is uh, there's financial impacts for some of these municipal services to stay at or to rise to the level of, of, um, of uh, professionalism and uh, standards that, that the province is looking to get to. What I want you folks to all understand and, and, uh, and to feel confident in is that there's gonna be no impact of service delivery from the RCMP. Uh, you know, we're ensuring our frontline members are probably supported, adequately resourced. Nothing's gonna change as a result of, as a result of this vote. Um, the each and again, I've already talked about this point um, with respect to the responsibilities under the Police Act. But um, we have that complete cadre of services. We have access, ready access to all these services that are within these standards, and uh, it's not going to affect our our service delivery to you. So I just wanted to, to make sure that you were you were confident in that. Um, as we move forward with modernizing uh, policing along with the province of Nova Scotia, it's going to address the need for, for provincial police standards, similar to what's found in other Canadian provinces. This is not unique to Nova Scotia. It's across Canada. We all want higher levels of policing standards. Um, it's also going to expedite ongoing work related to necessary creation of MOUs with police agencies that request the assistance of our specialized services. So perhaps that's part of the issue here is through these policing standards, once they're revoked, these other agencies may have to engage in MOUs for use of our policing services, uh, which perhaps could come at a cost. Um, also, the, uh, it's, through this modernization, it's going to enhance the additional officer program. That is our school, uh, school liaison officers, which we call the SSROs, as well as the, uh, the street crime enforcement officers and uh, which all of them have been in place since 2020. Uh, excuse me, the assessment is, has been done by the province since 2020, and uh, we look forward to the recommendations once that's complete. So before you is that complete list of the support services that we have uh, within the RCMP, which brings me to something that I left off the agenda and something that came to our attention here very recently, and that is the headquarters is hosting uh, a police week uh, open house. It's this week, short notice, but I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't 
pass it on to everybody here in the room. It's going to be at our headquarters uh, May 19th. That's Thursday between four and eight. So at that event, it's it's a it's a come as you are very uh, you know informal type of event which will showcase a lot of these services. So if anyone's interested in in, in going to uh, 80 Garland Avenue in Dartmouth and uh, taking a look at uh, the open house and some of those policing services that will be that will be showcased there. I encourage you to do so. Um, I'll be there uh, and I'll be happy to, to take anyone around who, uh, who, who's there and present and to introduce you to some of our senior members as well as to, to uh, introduce you to some of the team members and team leaders that are in, involved in some of these support services. Um, so that is our presentation, Martin. Did you have? All right. First up, uh, Councilor Gordon Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, um, I'm just wondering, as far as the RCMP being uh, relegated to associate status, is that something that is that's a done deal? Um, okay, so there's no point in you know the municipality you know sending a letter that uh, expressing our dismay over that or. Uh, it, I, I'm not asking for that. Um, you're you're certainly welcome to do what you feel would be appropriate. Um, we, we were not consulted. It was a unilateral decision. We're very disappointed by that decision. Um, it's not in keeping with the principles of collaboration that is going to bring better policing to Nova Scotia. If uh, you saw fit to, to express your concern, I would, I would leave it to this body to make that decision for themselves. Um, the vote's been cast. Can it be undone? Um, I'm not a member of that body, so I'm not 100% mm -hmm. sure what that would look like. Uh, yeah. I suspect we could be voted in as well. Uh, but again, that's, that's off the top of my head. Um, okay, just a thought as to, uh, you know, if it, was a, uh, if it was carved in stone and, um, and if that might be something that we will maybe consider. Thank you. Yeah, I, would, I appreciate you giving that consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Warden Ralston. Yes, just within regards to the open house at headquarters, if any councillor has the free time, I'd certainly encourage you to take advantage of it. Uh, we were able to have, uh, I believe it was last term, some of us, a, a tour and, and that of headquarters, and it was uh, very educational and very interesting. Um, I think you would really, really enjoy it, so I would encourage them to go on. I'm babysitting a three-year-old and a year-and-a-half-old on that afternoon, and I'm not sure headquarters would be quite ready for, for them under my supervision. <laughs> so. Yeah, they'd be, they'd be welcome, but uh, yeah, that would be that would be uh, nice if anyone would attend again at your at your leisure. And I, I do appreciate it. it's very short notice. Good old yeah. yeah. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, just a reminder to councillors, that evening you do have um, some councillor training at 6. So the open house, I believe, starts at 4. So if you were planning on attending, it would be early that afternoon. Well, seeing no one else, I'm going to turn the chair over to the warden. Thank you, warden. Staff Sergeant, I'll, you know, uh, I'm on the representative over in the Nova Scotia Police Governance Association. We have had, uh, you know, uh, Zoom meetings with the uh, Department of Justice. And from what I'm getting from that is the police service across Nova Scotia is on hold, really, until the Mass Casualty Commission completes its, resort, or completes its re uh, findings. You know, we basically were told that there's, uh, you know, there's two... Uh, two or three that are reviewing the services of the RCMP, so it's in flux. So until we get that, until we know where we're hidden, but for my position on that board, whether rightly or wrongly, I feel that there's a definite animosity between municipal police forces and the RCMP. Now, whether that has uh, been made smaller, for lack of a better word, or it has enlarged in the last little while is, is just just the way it is out there. So that may be part of this not, you know, voting you guys to non-voting status. Um, you know, rightly or wrongly, uh, I think that uh, the media does play a big part in this. 
And uh, what I'm saying here is, okay, you're, you know, this is a specialized services that you guys can provide. And uh, I, I, where I do appreciate that, uh, I do think that, you know, there has been rumor out there that it, that uh, provincial police force is not is not off the table within Nova Scotia. So I see that uh, there's a lot of animosity out there, and I see a lot of people that, you know, rightly or wrongly, or, or the RCMP are taking a lot of heat for you know things that have have happened in the past, uh, but. That's what I see from, from my vantage point, rightly or wrongly, and, and I don't expect you to answer that, but uh, there, is a, there, there is an animosity, and you can feel it, you can feel it in there. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to make that point. Thank you, Chair. And, um, you know, all I guess I could say about that is uh, the East Hans, uh detachment of uh, the RCMP is, you know, we're... We're very collaborative with our part policing partners. We we hold no animosity toward toward any of our uh, bordering uh, police agencies, and uh, you know, public safety is our main priority. It always will be, uh, and we seek to to work hard with everybody to to establish that. Um, will you know the future will tell what what happens with policing in Nova Scotia? But I guess my pledge is, as long as the RCMP is policing East Hans, we're going to do the best that we can to provide the best service we can. We do appreciate that, Corey, but it's just, it, you know, the world itself is, is in a state of, uh, is in a state, let me put it that way, and, and in the policing services across Nova Scotia is no different. It's in a, it, it, there's a lot of questions and confusion in there. So uh, hopefully things will settle down mm -hmm. in the near future, but uh, I just wanted to bring that point. That, Thank that you. This is from my vantage point of what I'm saying. The warden? Back to me. Anything further to bring before this meeting? Seeing no speakers, I'll entertain a motion for adjournment to return to corporate and residential services. So moved. We move Councilor Green, second by Deputy Warden. All those in favor? Aye. Contrary to Marin, motion carried. Thank you, uh, Staff Sergeants, and forgive me, I, I don't know your name, so. Sergeant. Martin Roy. We'll just call you Serge. Serge and Staff Serge. Good That's that. good, right? Thank you. Thank you for coming and thank you for providing that report. And thank you for the public members who attended today. Thank you. <laughs> well. Yes, we do too. Kim, when it comes to the employee introductions, we'll just turn it over to you. Once you go through it. All right, everybody, we're going to call call to order of the uh, Red Corporate Residential Service Committee. First, we're looking for the approval of minutes of April 19th, 2022. Moved by Councilor Rhino, seconded by the Deputy Warden. Next item, or next topic, is going to be new employee introductions, and for that, we're going to turn it over to the CAO. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, um, this month we have um, five new employees to introduce. Four of them are on term positions here with the municipality. 
Uh, we have a civil engineering student um, working with us. Duna will be working with us until the end of August, uh, primarily with INO on the asset management portfolio and getting their data um, up to speed. Uh, Jacqueline LeBlanc, she's with us again, uh, returning with us this summer. She provides administrative support over the summertime for various departments, backfilling, so we can ensure that our customers uh, continue to receive front office support um, to the quality that they have come to expect. Uh, Tracy Blois is with us for a term uh, covering a maternity leave and our custodial staff. Uh, we welcome her for a term of seven months. And we have Leanne Martin with us, who is a planner. She has uh, come to us from the Port Hawkesbury area, uh, and she'll be providing planning support as they work through uh, several planning applications and the plan update uh, that's underway uh, at this time. And we also have one full-time permanent position that has been filled this month. Uh, Dylan Wells is joining us as the new heavy equipment operator at the Waste Management Center. Uh, Dylan is from uh, East Hants and brings with him um, various experience on multiple heavy equipment. Uh, and we welcome him to our staff and wish him a long and prosperous career with these hands. Thank you, CAO. Um, I gotta go back to um, the approval of the minutes because I realized it was, it was uh, first and seconded, but we never actually had the vote. So all those in favor of approval of the minutes, raise your hand, aye. Contrary, motion is passed. All right, thank you, and welcome to all the new employees uh, that are here for hopefully a long time and a short time with these stands. Next, we're going to go on to the former Elmsdale and Lance school sites, uh, the Request for Council workshop, and uh, take it away. I don't speak very loud, so I do need. Fantastic. Wonderful. <laughs> test, test, one, two, three. Uh, thank you, through the chair. So I was uh, in front of you back in March to give you an update on the former Elmsdale and Lance School Sites project, in which we've since awarded the, pro uh, the project to a team of FBM, Turner Drake, and Englobe. We've uh, under. We've already started task one, we're well underway. And based off that work plan, we're in front of you today for a request for council workshop. As you recall, we talked about uh, coming to council with a little workshop to talk about the highest and best uses before we get too far into the project. So we wanted to talk today about a potential June 23rd uh, workshop date. So that's the executive committee meeting, meeting uh, extension night for that month. And if the June 23rd date doesn't work for you folks, we're hoping we could do the July 21st date in order to work uh, appropriately with our project plan. So, and just a reminder on that, once we've done that workshop, uh, I'll, be, I'll be back in front of you um, with approval, a request for approval to proceed with tax two. So the recommended motion is on the screen and I welcome your conversation between the June 23rd date and July 21st. Thank you. All right, um, recommended motion up there. Anybody like to speak on this topic? Council Head. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would move the council workshop be held on June 21st. 23rd. 23rd. To discuss the potential highest and best uses for the former elementary, for Elmsdale and Land School sites. Second. Motion by Councilor Hebb, seconded by Deputy Warden. Any discussion on it? The Warden, you were on. Go ahead, Warden. Uh, I just noticed that the um there is a presentation scheduled for June 23rd at Riverside Education Center to present a leadership award. Um, we could, you know, I'm, I'm just not sure if a council, if a councillor wishes to attend or present that. It's traditional if a councillor is available to do that. If not, staff does it, but that could impact someone. I just wanted to raise that, that date. Well, when looking at that, if uh, that, that starts at 6.30 yes. in Milford. So if we were to start the workshop at 7 o'clock, that might help alleviate any conflicts. No, I'm not sure of a schedule at Riverside. Yeah, let me see. I said they could work with the school to try and have that award on. 
I just wanted to bring that folks attention. Thank you. Nope. Thank you, Warden. Um, all right. See no more discussion. We'll be looking for the question. Question. Questions for call. We'll go to the vote. Still waiting. Oh, Councilor Green. Okay, motion is passed unanimously. Next up will be, oh, yes, go ahead. <laughs> Next up, special election for District 4. Shirley. moment to catch up. There we go. So as you're all aware, we are in the situation where we need to conduct a special election for District 4 uh, following the resignation of Councillor Knockwood. So uh, similar to the election that we had last year uh, to fill the vacancy in District 7, the recommendations um, are in line and in keeping with the recommendations from last year. We do have uh, an anticipated budget of approximately $15,000 to conduct this um, election. There is money available in the election reserve. We are suggesting that that money not be used in this case um, because we do have a 2024 regular election coming up that we will have to fund as well. So we are uh, recommending that the general tax rate year-end surplus be considered as a funding source for the $15,000. And uh, in the report as well, it outlines the requirements um, under the Elections Act, under the Gov uh, Municipal Government Act, um, how the dates need to fall uh, when election has to be nomination day uh, and so forth. We've also included a section about some stats uh, around uh, the success of our recent um, elect electronic vote options. So for phone and online voting um, has been very successful. So we are recommending that we do another fully electronic uh, election for this special election. We're also recommending that IntelliVote be used again. Uh, they uh, have gotten to know us very well and, and have been very uh, good to work with and uh, help us complete these successful elections in the last two. Uh, we've done a cost of the uh, paper versus electronic. It's, it is significantly a higher cost to have polling stations uh, and paper votes, uh, approximately a $14 per vote cost for fully electronic versus a $74 per vote cost for running polling stations. So the dates that we are suggesting um, is the nomination day would be held June 28th. We would do a week-long advance poll period prior to the special election day regular poll of July 23rd. So that would get us done before the end of July. Uh, council would be able to do the swearing in at your July council meeting. Uh, to avoid the summer, really the summer um, vacation highlights are usually uh, in August, and um, it also avoids the long weekend. So there's just a little bit more background there about the legislation. And then the recommendations uh, are on the screen. So again, it's that the CAO be appointed as returning officer. Uh, she's delegated the authority to determine any uh, fees, expenses. She can appoint uh, an assistant returning officer, approving the dates, the budget, that the provincial permanent registry of voters from uh, Elections Nova Scotia be used as the preliminary list of electors. That uh, we did check is available and it is updated to May 9th. So anybody that has been added to a provincial list or um, the data that they get from the federal government, uh, or their various sources would be as of May 9th. So if any changes needed to be made after that, we would have to collect that and make changes uh, as part of our revision process. 
And again, that revision process that you're giving the authority that that can happen right up until poll day and that IntelliVote systems be hired to provide the electronic voting services. If you have any questions, I can hey, hopefully Thank you, Shirley. First up, Councillor Rhino. Well, Ms. Walker, probably to nobody's surprise, um, I would still like to have that option of the paper vote in there. Yes, there's a cost, and there's a cost to everything. But uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, some out there who uh, who are, I guess, a lot like me, old school, and they like to put their X on a piece of paper. And uh, I've said this before within when uh, the Alliance election took place, and uh, and I'll say it again, and I'll, I'll I'll keep keep it going. Like I think it's better to have the three options out there uh, for everyone to partake in, and uh, that that's my feeling. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Warden Roll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I guess uh, for many years I, I liked having all options too, but I have found through the last two times in the main election we did have that option, and there was very low uptake on the paper ballot. And every, um, you know, many seniors and other folks in my district really, really enjoyed the ease of the electronic voting, whether it was by computer or by phone. And given that it isn't into August, it is in the summer, the electronic voting, you know, you could be on holiday in Ontario and still vote in, in your election. So I'm supportive of using IntelliVote similar to as we did in the last by election. So I would move the uh, recommended motion as shown in the report. Second. Moved by the warden, seconded by Councillor Hepp. Is there any further discussion? Question's been called. We'll go to the vote. The votes are in. The motion is passed with Councillor Rhino voting nay. Next up, we'll have the Dr. J.T. Snow Bursary and Leadership Award presentations and graduation ceremonies. Good morning, committee. It feels a little bit different being on this side of the table this morning, but I am very excited to present a staff report on the James T. Snow Bursary and Leadership Awards for, excuse me, 2022. Um, so as you all know, Council, Council awards a $1,000 bursary for Dr. James T. Snow annually to a recipient at each of the following schools in which a lot of the East Hance uh, people go to. So East Hance Rural High School, Avonview High, Hance North Rural High School. Um, so traditionally, a member of council attends the graduation ceremony to make the presentation on behalf of council. And council has previously identified the following presenters uh, for the bursary. So in 2019, uh, Councillor King presented for Hans East, Councillor Musa presented in 2019 for Avonview, and um, then Councillor Eleanor w Rulstead, excuse me, um, presented in Hans North. Um, due to the COVID pandemic, graduations were not held for the 2020 and 2021 year, and this year Avonview High School has chosen um, to not host presenters as they will be doing uh, what they call another drive-by graduation. Um, as well, a member of council is also asked to present the leadership awards um, to Hans North Rural High, Riverside Education Center, and Uniac District School. Um, so if you take a look, um, the last presenter, um, so Hans North kind of goes in a cycle with the Hans North counselors. Um, next on the list to present would be Councillor Rhino, um, but staff is 
asking for a list of volunteers. Thank you. All right, counselors, you see before you the names that need to be filled in. Is there anybody interested in uh, taking part or being a presenter? First up on the list, Councillor Garden Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm just looking at a schedule here, but I would be interested in presenting, um, just looking at the last day of school, I believe, to uh, Hans East on the 29th. Okay. Deputy Ward. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I'd be willing to do the uh, leadership award at Riverside Education Center on the 23rd. Okay. Thank you. Warden. Um, unsure as to yet the date of the leadership award at Hans North. Um, Generally, it's the day after graduation. Um, uh, it's, if it is that day, and, and I'm certainly if any of the other rural counselors is available that day, that's great too. But if not, uh, assuming that's the date, I'd be willing to do that. All right. Next up, Councilor Rhino. Well, uh, I guess with the cycle that was created in the past, I guess uh, my name is would be up for the Hans North graduation night. Councilor Brown for Hans North. If I could just, unless Councilor Musa would like to, um, I will take the uh, Uniac District School. And that leaves us full now, I do believe. Yep. All right. So there's a recommended motion up there that the bursaries be presented at Hans East Rural High by Councillor Garden Cole, Hans North Rural High by Councillor Rhino, Hans North Rural High Leadership Award by Warden Rolston, Riverside Educational Center Leadership Award, Deputy Warden Mitchell, and Uniac District School, Councillor Michael Perry. Moved by Councillor Tingley. Second. Seconded by the Deputy Warden. Any further discussion? Question. Question's been called. We'll go to the vote. And the motion has passed unanimously. Perfect. Thank you so much, Council. Thank you. All right, Councillors, we are scheduled break time. <clears throat> So we will take a break. It is now 10.34. We'll take a 10-minute break and return at 10.44. All those in favor? Aye. Contrary? Boom.
Thumbs up and we're good to go. All right, good to go. All right. Call the meeting back to order. First up after the break is the council hospital hospitality policy. Uh, Adam and Noah, go ahead. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a quick reintroduction to uh, committee of uh, Nathan Hoffman, Nathan. our policy analyst. Um, uh, you may remember Nathan from uh, 2020. He was a student with us um, and presented a few times virtually uh, to committee and council then, and he returned to us in late summer of 2021 as a full-time policy analyst and also does corporate uh, special corporate projects for for us. Um, he's got a heavy workload, and, and, and council's going to see quite a bit of Nathan over the next uh, months and, and years as we bring back uh, council policies for review or things are assigned. Um, Nathan's also been working on administrative policy reviews as well on an internal level. So just a quick reintroduction to Nathan. You'll see him again later this afternoon as things are starting to move on the policy side uh, for us as an organization in our review process. Thank you. And my apologies, Nathan. I called oh, you no one. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, let me just make this full screen. Come on. Perfect, thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. So today I'm here to seek your direction for a council hospitality policy for the municipality. So back in 2017, the province amended the MGA requiring all municipalities to enact a hospitality policy this policy essentially outlines what is considered an eligible hospitality expense and also outlines certain reporting requirements for these expenses. In practice, the municipality already meets and satisfies the requ reporting requirements quarterly and annually, but we do lack the ratified policy which the MGA requires. A majority of the policy is pretty set in stone by the MGA. We don't have much control over it. However, there are two sections, the alcohol section and the gift section, which council has a bit more control over. So we are here today seeking our, guide, our direction on these two sections. To inform this discussion, staff uh, conducted a jurisdictional scan of what different municipalities in the province are doing. We reviewed the MGA and its regulations, as well as met with a representative of AMANS. So what is hospitality? Essentially, the MGA roughly boils it down to any expense incurred while promoting business within the municipality or hosting events with business leaders, industry leaders, foreign dignitaries on behalf of the municipality. Examples of hospitality events include hosting foreign dignitaries, business, uh, hosting business leaders, community leaders, labor leaders, hosting conferences, as well as hosting ceremonies and other smaller events. As for the actual requirements of the hospitality policy, we can see on this table the MGA lays them out pretty clearly. They essentially boil down to three different types. What is a hospitality expense? Who is able to claim a hospitality expense? And um, what the procedure to be reimbursed for a hospitality expense is. On the two rows at the bottom, you can see the two el elements council has a bit more control over. Is alcohol an eligible expense and are gifts an eligible expense? For alcohol, uh, the MGA requires us to determine if alcohol is an eligible expense for hospitality reimbursement. It's important to note that council is not eligible to reimburse alcohol expenses for themselves. However, this policy would define if council is able to purchase alcohol on behalf of others. So for example, say the premier comes out for dinner and the warden and the CAO host him. If he orders a glass of wine, is that glass of wine eligible to be expensed for their reimbursement? This policy is essentially asking you to answer that question. A majority of the municipalities with published hospitality policies have decided to make alcohol an eligible expense. I've included a sample from CBRM, essentially saying it's preferred that it's not, but we will um, reimburse counselors for these expenses. Onto the giving gifts section, this section is not required under the MGA. 
However, roughly half of the municipalities in the province have elected to include it within their hospitality policy. I've included an example from the District of Clare, and essentially it says, we will give token gifts up to a value of $200 for the purpose of hospitality expenses. But we do not have to include this section at all within the policy if that is not your direction. Additionally, there is a receiving gifts consideration. So this is also not required by the MGA, but aligns with our corporate values uh, for accountability, responsibility, transparency, as well as fiscal responsibility. Staff have drafted some potential language you can see about what that section might look like. It's important to note that the council procedural policy already prohibits council from accepting gifts that might have the appearance or influence of um, over decision making. However, this policy, this section of the policy would say what sort of circumstances it might be acceptable to receive gifts. It's important to know that currently no other municipality has elected to include this section in their hospitality policy, but we thought we'd bring it forward for your consideration. So in conclusion, the municipality already meets a majority of the requirements of the hospitality policy, except for the formal ratification of this policy. Staff are seeking your direction on, is alcohol an eligible expense? Should the gift section be included? If so, should we include the giving gift section or the receiving gift section? And following your direction, we'll have a draft version of the policy uh, to present for your discussion at June Executive Committee. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. First up is the warden. Thank you. Um, having read this over, um, I think I'm in agreement with the alcohol as an eligible expense as outlined and the, and the sample from CBRM looked pretty good to me. Um, I don't think any of us would want to be in a situation if East Hance was hosting another level of government or you know, perhaps um, there, there could be many dignitaries or officials that we would be hosting, maybe not often, but I wouldn't want to be in the position of saying, oh, I'm sorry, sir or ma'am, you can't order wine with your dinner unless you're prepared to pay for it yourself. It would be rather embarrassing. Um, so I, I would be in agreement with that in the limited circumstances as outlined. The gift section, I uh, don't have a problem formalizing the giving of gifts. Um, I would probably go with the rest of the municipalities and not include a section on receiving gifts because I do think we're covered as counselors under our, our policy. And I think you just, when you try to fine tune that, you just get very confused. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, okay, last November, I got a letter from I think it was the Legionnaires, but I'm not sure. Now I'd have to go back and look. And they included with their letter a poppy. You know, one of the poppies, the plastic or metal ones with the thing. I, th I think they cost a dollar or two. No, it was a regular poppy with a little plastic thing to fasten it instead of a pin. That's what it was. And I thought, gee, that's, you know, a one or two dollar item is that something I'd have to be declaring if I've got one of those in the mail and uh, you know that type of thing would be and in the 24 years or so that I've been here um, other than the odd pen if someone does a presentation and gives us each a pen or something uh, I don't think I'm alone I haven't been inundated with offers of gifts and I you know certainly because of our policy I wouldn't accept anything that I would consider to be a, you know, major influence, yes. So so those would be my comments. Um, I would uh, include the alcohol as an eligible expense as outlined, the giving of gifts section be included, but not the receiving of gifts. And those are my comments, and I'd be prepared to make that a motion and see where it goes. Moved by the warden, seconded by Councillor Hebb. On before the motion, Councillor Rhino. Yeah. Speaking to the motion. Um, just hold on, Councillor Rhino. Just trying to wait for this. There we go. You're good to go. Good to go? Yeah, you're good now. Right. 
I'm taking an opposite view on this. I, I, I can see if, if this was just a private business, I could see, okay, those are good business things to do. We're not a business, we're a government. Uh, people were here, people pay taxes for, for that reason, and that's how we, we do our work. I think that this, to me, this bringing this hospitality policy at this time is, is not the good time to do it. We have rising gas prices, rising fuel prices, we have rising everything out there, and we have people struggling to get by. A lot of them may view this as, oh, you're going to buy a, uh, a dignitary coming in here, uh, a drink, but you're not going to do it, you know, you wouldn't buy me a drink. And that's how people are going to think of this. You know, so I, I, I have trouble with that one. Uh, I really do. And, you know, dignitaries, whoever they are, they're still human beings. They have a respectful position, and I understand that. But they're still human beings. Also, on the giving of gifts, you know, and, and you put in here the $200 value not to exceed $200 as an example, $200 would go toward to pay somebody's property taxes and would go to go toward to help there. But, you know, so that's where I'm coming from. I'm coming from the people with feet on the ground and the people that are struggling to get by, the senior, seniors on fixed incomes. This will be seen as a perk. Pure and simple, that, this is how it will be, will be taken by a lot of seniors on fixed income. They're not giving us anything. Uh, they're, they're just the elected official. They're, you know, that, that gap between this and that it, it becomes larger. So, you know, where I can see this, if it's a private business, as I've said before, is a good way to do it. But I don't feel that it is a good way to do it for uh, municipal government. Thank you. That's my thoughts. Thank you, Councilor Rhino. Warden towards the motion. And well, speaking in support of the motion, I don't see this as introducing something new. I see it as formalizing something that we are already doing without a formal policy to support it. With regards to the alcohol policy, I don't see that as something that would happen often. But I do think that uh, there would be appropriate times if we were hosting a specific type of meeting or function. And as I said before, to, you know, I don't, I don't want to be whining and dining a member of a senior level of government trying to obtain funds for East Hans and, and say, oh, I'm sorry, we're not going to pay for that glass of wine. And I, I think that um, judgment would have to be exercised. And with the alcohol policy, it has to be pre-approved by the CAO or, or designate. And with the, with the gifts thing, I'm looking at it as we have a bit of swag here. And when we recently went to the NSFM conference, we were asked to provide a, a small gift for the fundraising part of the evening for a local fire department there. Um, we might often be asked to provide something for a fundraiser raising money for this, that, or the other charitable group in the municipality. And we might provide a picnic blanket or, you know, some a mug or some things like that. And I think that's, you know, I think that's appropriate to do to show support for those groups in, in fundraising situations should they ask for something like that. It's kind of similar. I, I, I would look at the pins that we give out in the, in the same light when we have a team going off to a, uh, you know, to a tournament or something somewhere, we will sometimes be asked for East Hans pins for them to take along and, and share with the others. And uh, that's what I see, the, the giving of gifts. I, that, that's my interpretation of it, that it would simply formalize what we already do to support groups and organizations. Um, I'm, I'm not interested in going through the phone book and getting a list of people and sending them all a picnic blanket or anything like that. But I do think it's simply formalizes and lays out what what would be acceptable and what would require approval and uh, it would simply formalize in most cases I think what we already do thank you thank you warden 
Go ahead, Adam. You that. Yeah. <clears throat> Through you, Mr. Chair, if this recommendation were to go through as it is uh, on the floor right now, the the funding amount of two hundred dollars that isn't um, you know we're bringing back a draft policy, and council can have that threshold discussion at that time as well. And the warden had mentioned the pre-approval process, which I was going to kind of. Uh, continue to, to reaffirm that is it's not a carte blanche for council it's very very infrequent um, that's something like um, providing an alcohol gift for a dignitary or business development community may may be brought forward I actually can't recall um, in, in most recent years where that has been but at least allowing yourself the flexibility to, to have that decision be made at that time uh, would be part of a, a policy conversation so um, that is just what I wanted to add Mr. Chair thank you Seeing nobody left left to talk, there's a motion on the floor. Questions, Questions have been called. We'll go to the vote. The votes are in with Councillor Rhino voting nay. Motion is passed. Thank you. All right, next up will be the Elmsdale Main Street Village Core Design with Graham. Good, good morning, everyone, and uh, through you, uh, Mr. Chair, good morning, councillors. Um, we're here, this, or I'm here this morning to present to you the uh, Elmsdale Village Core Streetscape uh, uh, concept design. So um, this concept design uh, really came out of a number of different plans that, uh, that have been brought forward to council over the years. And uh, it's focused on really identifying um, or identifying and addressing some of the challenges that come about because a lot of main streets in, or a lot of communities in Nova Scotia lack um, a defined or uh, uh, contained main street or downtown area um, due to provincial roads running through their communities. And East Hans is certainly uh, one of those communities as, as many are aware. Um, this really does create challenges for uh, businesses looking to build and grow in our area um, and in many areas in Nova Scotia and for residents who want to participate in uh, community activities um, and the local economy, uh, whether it be through employment or uh, uh, by spending money locally at, at businesses. In 2019, East Hance had the opportunity and participated in the Main Street for Nova Scotia Communities Initiative. And this initiative and project focused on walkability, accessibility, uh, transportation, and um, creating economic activity through the design of central provincial roads in uh, rural communities in Nova Scotia. Um, the goal of the project was really to highlight issues uh, and develop ways to improve the challenges in the areas where the highways are the main street. And East Hance uh, Municipal Council recognized this, uh, the importance of this issue and most recently put in place an objective in the uh, strategic plan to create a vision and plan for the redevelopment of the Elmsdale Village Core. So in order to complete this objective uh, for Council, East Hance staff from Planning and Development, um, Infrastructure and Operations, and Economic and Business Development engaged um, FBM incorporated as a consultant to help collaborate uh, with councillors, local businesses, developers, and community groups and residences, residents to create a long-term uh, design and uh, streetscape vision for a portion of the Route 214 in Elmsdale. The, um, the completed report has been attached to this, uh, to this staff report for council to review, and uh, we're, we're going to go through a couple of the, the high-level uh, items on the report itself. So in developing this concept design, um, the report uh, considered a number of previous reports, including the 2011 Village Core study and the, uh, the Main Street for Nova Scotia Communities um, initiative. 
And from that, uh, as well as some relevant data, including traffic counts and population numbers, um, there were a number of key themes that emerged. Um, the first and foremost was that many businesses within East Hants are unable to secure commercial space uh, with visibility and foot traffic to support and grow their business. The current Route 214 is not conducive to residents walking, biking, and spending time, which of course is critical to those local businesses' success. Those businesses need people in front of their shops in order to be successful. There, there are obvious issues with traffic and parking, um, and the need for community amenity and gathering spaces is, really came to the forefront as important to the residents and community. There's uh, a lot of interest in the redevelopment of the former Elmsdale school site, and, and you heard from Amy earlier about going forward with that project and the opportunities that are available on the, for public space within that site. Um, this, this portion of the Route 214 is, is an emerging main street, um, but it is also a vehicle through fare uh, for many commuters and truck traffic traveling to and from the 102 and into the uh, neighboring communities of Elmsdale, Lance, and Enfield. And I think the big one, of course, is that uh, Nova Scotia Department of Public Works owns and maintains the road right away, and their design input was critical throughout this process. And I should note here that they were heavily involved in the concept design that is in front of council. Um, throughout the entire process, uh, a number of engagements were held with them, and they provided review and feedback on the report. So within the concept uh, design report itself, a number of elements were identified as, as, as essential to help address these issues um, that, we, that we've outlined above. Um, they range from everything, uh, including walking and active transportation, which council is quite familiar with, to trees and landscaping requirements, um, how, how we should go about, or how there, we have opportunities to go about de new development and infill, um, parking, roadway design, uh, how driveways and side streets can interact with the roadway, and uh, how potential future transit could um, play into the Main Street design as well. As part of each of these elements, um, the concept plan proposes a number of recommendations within the plan itself that Council could consider. These include um, designing separate walking and cycling paths on both sides of the Route 214, um, continuing to work with Nova Scotia Department of Public Works to design accessible crosswalks at the Horn Road and Rolston Drive um, uh, areas, and continuing to explore the three roadway designs uh, options that were requested um, by councillors at the council engagement session um, that some councillors were able to, to attend and are identified in the report. There's also recommendations for developing a village core parking strategy to guide the provision of parking in the future. Um, there's uh, recommendations in terms of how to implement placemaking elements like trees, lighting, banners, small public spaces along the main street. Um, and I think overall it's important for council to note that um, all of these recommendations are, and the resulting work um, would be brought forward for future discussion to council as at the appropriate time and when those um, opportunities arise and through the uh, annual budgeting process. Collaboration is a big part of this concept design um, and one of the key recommendations is to work with the business and development community to create um, new development uses and uh, redevelopment along the 214. This will help to infill um, some of the, uh, the gaps in the streetscape right now and provide a vitality of mix through land use types and amenities. This infill could um, include outdoor spaces, community uses, housing options for families and workers, and the uh, potential to explore ha affordable housing opportunities along the 214. There's also the potential um, for uh, continued retail development and um, professional services will play a big role in the infill of, of the 214. And also, um, cont again, continuing to work with uh, Nova Scotia Department of Public Works to consider um, reducing the uh, setbacks from the roads um, to help build a more consistent streetscape than, than what we see right now on the 214. So that involves um, working on a case-by-case -case basis with Department of Public Works to evaluate new development and infill um, in terms of how that will play uh, with the streetscape. Um, feedback was obtained on the draft concept design uh, through initial workshops with uh, some municipal councillors held in December and then also um, through virtual stakeholder meetings with um, uh, uh, community members and um, uh, residents uh, in January. And these uh, comments were also received from stakeholders uh, by phone and email. 
So overall, the concept design proposes a number, number of recommendations to achieve Council's vision of a vibrant and dynamic uh, commercial district that could be implemented over the next number of years. Um, it does make some recommendations in phasing and, and how, how we could go about doing that uh, in terms of the future uh, detailed design. And it does make a note that construction implementation would occur in such a way that costs are managed and the end vision is um, always supported. So we would look to bring items forward over in the future as the opportunities arise. So whether that's um, in, in aligned with um, Department of Public Works plans for the 214 or as other projects go forward in the municipality. This plan, project does align with East Ant's strategic plan, as I noted before, and the goal of economic prosperity to develop vibrant commercial districts and specific, specifically fulfills objective four to create a vision, for the plan, um, a vision and plan for the redevelopment of the Elmsdale Village core. And again, any fu future financial impacts arising from the Elmsdale Village core would be brought forward to council um, through the East Ant's annual budgeting process. Um, I, the report has been attached, and I'll bring up the recommended motion. So the recommended motion is move that Corporate and Residential Services Committee recommends to Council to adopt the Elmsdale Village Core Concept Design Report as attached to the Executive Committee Agenda, April 19th, 2022. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. First up to speak, Deputy Warden Mitchell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to staff, uh, during this process and looking ahead, do you think that we'll have any problems with truck traffic that now uses the 214? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, the report and design does uh, incorporate in a number of elements um, that take into consideration the tra traffic and, and the three concept options that uh, the Council looked at. Each of those accommodates truck traffic in a different way. Um, certainly, there, there are opportunities to uh, meet and, and work with those businesses that do have the truck traffic or that do generate some of that truck traffic coming through the 214. Uh, as as the 214 evolves and into the future, um, so the we'll get better numbers from Department of Public Works in terms of how the Lance Interchange has inter impacted uh, the truck traffic on the 214 in the coming months, as they have a uh, spring planned uh, traffic count that will um, uh, count actual truck traffic as well as as uh, uh, regular vehicular traffic. I'll move the recommended motion as presented. Moved by Deputy Warden. Seconded by Councillor Musa. Two people on to speak before the motion. First up, Councillor Musa. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Graham, it's, uh, is it 214 on a blue route? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, the 214, uh, or I believe the 2 is part of the uh, blue route, um, and I can bring it up quickly for you here. There is, it's not the 2? Um, the Director of Infrastructure and Operations is saying that the 214 is not part of the blue route, So, uh, but the Highway 2, I believe, is, yes. Yeah, but I know, I know it made a big difference for Cycler and a little bit blocking in Mount Uniac after they put those cyclone lane and stuff. So is there any way to engage the MLA to probably add the 214 to something like that, to the blue route or? Um, yeah, if, if that was a desire of council, we could certainly uh, work with the, we, with the province around um, what opportunities exist for uh, expansion of the blue route. Um, you can see the blue route highlighted in the image above along the, the uh, highway two there. I think um, as a destination, uh, it, it really, the 214 in the Main Street um, area really would provide a, a stop off for the Blue Route itself. I'm not sure, I, I'm not an AT expert, but, uh, but we would rely on them to, to tell us whether um, you know, it, it needs to be incorporated in or whether it could be a, a, a nice adjacent stop to the Blue, Blue Route itself. Oh, okay. Thank you. Is that everything, Councilor Musa? Next up, Councillor Hebb. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just some comments. I know that everything that comes to Council here, whether it's development or what the zoning change, or whatever, one of the biggest things we get is traffic. And we already have a traffic problem on 214 there now. And, you know, we all we know how many businesses are uh, 
quarries, mills, and all that kind of stuff. This project, I certainly see the concept of it, and I think it's a, it's a great thing for the municipality, and it's a great thing for the 214. It's going to be done in phases, and we've got a new uh, proposed subdivision coming out of Rolston Drive and Pine Hill, which is certainly going to increase the traffic load there. I think our priority is, for, if we're going to do phases, we have to upgrade 214 to handle the traffic that's going to be proposed here because all the stuff when it goes to the public, that's the first thing they're going to ask is, you know, what about the traffic? You know, how's the traffic going to travel here? I think if we put that as a priority for the number one phase, they will see that that part has already been answered rather than go down the road and, and you know, this is something you fellows should have thought about first about the traffic. So, um, my own personal opinion, I think, uh, we have, by the Irving, we have three lanes there. The middle lane, you can turn left or right. I think that is what has to go from there right to the Elmsdale Square. Because you have a vehicle going either way, wanting to make a left-hand turn, it's no time the traffic is backed up. And by having that middle lane open, if one does happen to want to make a turn, it's not impeding the flow that's already there. So. Um, my comment is, I think if we're going to do this in phases, I think we should look at transportation as being the first phase we do before we do anything. And that would alleviate a lot of the problems that's going to come to us down the road. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just my comments. Thank you, Councillor. <clears throat> Seeing no one left to speak. Oh, under the wire, the warden. Uh, I just wanted to comment that by adopting this plan, we're not committing to doing anything at any given time. Uh, our commitment is that we think this plan looks like a good plan for the 214. And as opportunities, as staff have said, as Graham has said, would arise if uh, transportation is going to be doing this or that or in that area, that might provide an opportunity for us to do something, maybe something along the lines of what Councillor Hebb is suggesting. Um, I think it just provides an outline of what we're looking for and and gives staff the, uh, the ability to say, okay, we, we found out that this is going to happen on the 214. Is Council interested in doing this in conjunction with that to support this? And... Uh, you know, we might uh, we might come into a big pot of money and be able to do a whole lot of it at once. But I'm seeing it as a as a gradual thing, as budget permits, and as work done by the provincial government. You know, permits, and perhaps there will be businesses that will come forward along the 214 and say, we're looking at upgrading this, and and you know, maybe we're going to. Um, renovate our building or take it down and build a new building and while we're doing that we'd like to do this and so that's kind of i am i looking at it wrong i'm just seeing it as an outline of what we'd like to do with no specific uh you know no no specific timelines we want to have this done and then this and this by such and such a date but it just allows staff the guidance and the the confidence, I guess, to come to council and say, you said you were supportive of this. We have an opportunity. What do you say? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, y yes, exactly. This the, the purpose of this concept design is really to set the overall vision and say this is where council would like the 214 to go um, and use that to help guide our work. Um, in, 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 um, during the collaboration with the Department of Public Works, they, they really highlighted how good this plan was for them to understand what our concept was um, or could potentially be for the 214. So I think you said it quite well in that it, it's meant to shape and guide uh, staff's work for council in the coming years and, and be able to draw on the plan for um, design elements, inspiration, all of those pieces as that, uh, those opportunities arise in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Warden. And just for clarification, it's a living document. So as things change, the ability of the plan to adapt to it will be there as well. All right, be looking for the question. Question's been called. We'll go to the vote.
All the votes are in and it is passed unanimously. Thank you so much, Graham. Through Mr. Chair, thank you, everyone. <clears throat> Moving on to the next item, corridor community options, funding request. Back to you, Adam. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> it's just gonna be a moment while I flip my screen onto the report for committee today. So as um, committee will, will remember, in April, um, Corridor Community Options for Adults provided an update on their capital um, construction campaign, uh, as well as their fundraising efforts and the general overview of their programs and services. And they had two requests at that time, and it was for an additional uh, grant funding of uh, 300000 to support their capital project. And then also their second request was around uh, waiving of permit fees. And so council did request the staff report brought back on funding options um, to, for council discussion. So under the financial side of things, um, just a, a quick overview of the 300,000, if council wanted to grant that or a portion thereof, it could uh, form as part of the 2021, 2022 year end um, general tax surplus or contingency reserves. Um, and based on the CCA, CCOA floor plan they provided us at the time, uh, the charts in the um, report shows what their uh, permit fees would be, be like. So under, as they are a not-for-profit, you can see in this middle column here where my cursor is, there are some that are already exempt under um, policy. And then there are uh, some that aren't exempt, and those are due to other bylaws that council has in place around infrastructure. And so if council does want to look at waiving a, uh, their per permit fees or a portion thereof, it would be suggested <clears throat> that it is in the form of a grant versus waiving. Uh, a grant then allows for the proper internal accounting of those funds according to your policy. And you'll notice, uh, I'll come back to the recommendation later, but um, their estimated permit costs are around 9000 and the recommended motion for that uh, is up to 10,000. It is a little bit of a buffer there in case their floor plans change and the permit costs were, were to shift. So I'll just kind of go into a little bit of background on CCOA itself um, and the history uh, of their interactions with council as they've moved through this project. So in September of 2020, uh, CCOA purchased land from municipality in the Elmsdale Business Park for a total cost of 630,000 and that included <laughs> Uh, the land and, and um, various uh, charges at that time. Um, CCOA was also added to Council's Bylaw 400, which is the tax exemption bylaw, um, for both of those lots, 179 and 180 in the business park. So really what that means is uh, CCOA as a not-for-profit will be foregoing under Council's Bylaw, paying property taxes uh, for their assessment moving forward. And that was uh, the Council decision uh, then in May 2021, Council provided a, a grant in the amount of 200000 for CCOA for their new facility capital project. And in 2021, Council pr also provided a grant in the amount of 6000 to waive the deed uh, transfer taxes uh, associated with the land transfer uh, that had happened earlier. Um, so just a, cu a couple notes. The business, mark po uh, business park model is based on recovering the capital construction cost of the park. Um, so as council did approve for them to be tax exempt under bylaw, the land sale prices included the infrastructure costs, and I mentioned that uh, earlier. Um, so also to note, in their purchase and sale agreement, there is a clause in there. One of those lots was serviced and one of them was unserviced. Um, and there was a clause in the purchase and sale agreement that allows them to come back if they install new service lines um, for funding. I did speak with um, CCOA and they do not intend to come back to council for uh, those additional costs. So just a quick overview over their building. It's a 17 and a half thousand square foot building. Um, from their class B estimates, their construction costs are 6.2 million. Their project is geared to be tendered at the end of June 2022 and is expected to take one year to complete. 
their, their funding to date, they've received about 5.4 uh, million through various levels of government and donations already of 700,000, which is uh, pretty significant. They haven't even begun to begin their capital um, campaign, which they anticipated on raising another 700,000 through uh, community donations and so forth. Um, and their shortfall is intended to be uh, covered through a mortgage. They've identified that a new facility uh, will eliminate their wait list and inc increase their capacity from 40 um, participants to 125 and various and new expanded services. And I must say, um, I had the opportunity to tour the facility with um, uh, Ross Young a few weeks ago, and it was um, really remarkable to walk through and see very high energy, very uh, the staffing and the participants very welcoming, and just seeing how all their different services uh, operate in the building. And I, Think it'll be a great uh, addition to the community with their expanded services. So I thank uh, uh, Mr. Young for that uh, that tour. Um, and so just as part of council's decision making uh, today, you should consider the current funding that's already been provided and weighed against their additional requests for funds and the benefits the project brings to the community. We looked at council's strategic plan and if you want to consider granting them additional funding, it does align with your strategic plan. That's outlined in the staff report. Um, I already mentioned the infrastructure charges really are part of the bylaw associated with the permit fee, so it would be recommended that if you want to waive their, their permits, it really should be in the form of a grant. So we do have um, two motions in front of you, and we've separated them out, so if Council wants to have a discussion on both, what are the 300,000 the permits, uh, we've separated them out there, and we've left the uh, insert amount for the $300,000 uh, question, because that's really a, a Council conversation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Adam. First up to speak, Councillor Garden Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to touch on a few things that um, Adam just said. Uh, I am on the CCOA board, and I have uh, witnessed that they have worked tirelessly to secure substantial federal, provincial, and municipal funding for this project. They've raised an impressive uh, almost three quarters of a million dollars on their own and are uh, intending to uh, looking to raise that much again, so it's, it is remarkable. The benefit of this project for the community of East Hans is undeniable, and their expanded capacity and new services this project <coughs> will allow are invaluable to the lives of the residents that will be able to take advantage of this and not to mention the benefits to the community through the employment that it will provide and, uh, and the services that it will offer our community as well. And on that, I would like to uh, move the recommended motion with the insert amount being $300,000. Moved and seconded. There are people on to speak. First up, the warden. Thank you. Um, I would echo what Councillor Garden Cole has said, and I would just add that I think we are extremely fortunate to have this facility and these folks within East Hance providing the services that they provide. Um, they're far reaching. It's not just a corridor initiative. There are, you know, it, it's available to residents all over the municipality, and I know there's uptake from communities outside of the corridor. Um, I think it's wonderful. It provides not only employment for folks working at the facility, but employment for the participants in the program. And it gives them a sense of pride and accomplishment in, in what they can do there. And it also provides for some families some ability to structure their day-to-day -day lives. And, and, you know, I just think it's a very valuable service and one we're fortunate to have, and I support the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Warden. Next up, Councillor Musa. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm in full support too, of the motion. But I have a question about the year end surplus. I think, like, like when we were doing the budget, the staff were hesitant to lower the taxes on people that paid it already and not tap into that reserve. So I think, I think for the next time we have a budget, I think we should have uh, an idea about that surplus. This way we can do a better budget. And because... Until now, we don't know. Like probably staff knows, but I think we should know too how much, it, how much that should be. Like around how much is. The, I know you don't have the exact amount, but I think at budget time we should have an idea about it, to be able to to watch it better. 
Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. We can just pass the chair over to the warden for a second. Um, I'm in full support of, uh, of the motion as well. Um, I do have a question. Um, the participants at CCOA, um, is East Hans residence the primary or is any resident in the area? Like we, we do border very close with HRM and I'm just wondering, um, do they accept people from outside East Hans into their program? Um, <clears throat> through you, Mr. Chair, yes, they do. Um, in our conversations with uh, Mr. Young, it is primarily East Hans, but uh, they do service uh, a wider area as, as well as part of the participants, but it is primarily focused in, in our area. Okay. I, like I said, I have no problem supporting the motion, supporting the funding, but I, I would like to see, like, I would like to hear back from them at some point how much is outside of East Hans, um, because at the end of the day, it's the East Hans taxpayers are are helping provide this service for, for, for residents. Uh, they, that it, that is uh, three, Mr. Chair, something we will follow up and um, bring to council at a later date through their uh, other granting reporting. Yeah, they, 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 they do a wonderful job and, and I'm not trying to be, you know, I'm not trying to say nobody from HRM or any other area shouldn't have access. It's just something that would be, would be good to know, especially where they are in a waiting list um, situation and uh, with such sub substantial financial contributions of the East Hans, not only community, but uh, municipal government and every taxpayer within East Hans. Um, I think uh, that should be taken into consideration. The, la the last thing I have to say is, you know, uh, up here it says that, you know, the contribution that we've made towards this project is 200,000, but the f our total contribution is gonna be a lot more than that with not the tax revenue. We're not gonna take, we're not gonna charge them commercial taxes not to mention the number of grants and stuff we've given to them in the past. The, the municipality of East Hans has been a strong supporter of this program and I'm happy to see we're continually supporting it going forward, but we've definitely uh, provided more than just the 200,000 that's listed in the report. Thank you. Back to you. Councillor Ryan. I'm in support of the motion. Uh, I think it provides a valuable service. But, uh, it, you know, you're saying that this for this money to come on a year-end surplus, correct? Correct. Okay. I sat in this council chamber well, during, during tax time, during our budgeting process, and I asked, cannot we lower that tax rate by taking more of that surplus? And I was told at the time that, no, we shouldn't do that because we, have, we don't know the funding from the RCMP. And what that back back pay is going to be, for lack of a better back pay for, for those, and who is going to fund it. What's changed? Okay, CAO, I believe, is going to take this one. Go ahead, CAO. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, nothing has changed, Councillor. We still don't know the back pay for the RCMP, um, and we still wouldn't recommend during a budget process that you take your surplus and artificially lower your tax rate for the next year because you're still going to have to play that catch up the year after when you don't have that surplus. What has changed um, from when we did the budget, and the budget does include the projected surplus to the end of the year. There is a column in your budget document that does that. Um, the D transfer tax has continued to come in at a significant rate uh, since you would have looked at your initial budget draft and since we finalized the budget, we are now, I believe, sue over $3 million in detransfer tax, which no one would ever have expected. I mean, we budgeted for 2021, 2022, hesitantly increasing our detransfer tax by a couple of hundred thousand in the budget. That has been blown out of the water given the, the, the current real estate um, phenomenon, I guess, or whatever is going on in the real estate market. So. Your D transfer tax is what has changed, which gives us some confidence to say that you could take this out of your 300 out of your year-end surplus. Alternatively, you could just say that you take it out of your contingency reserve, which is where your year-end surplus is going to end up going in the end. So, um, you will have enough money to cover this in your year-end surplus. We still wouldn't recommend that you start to artificially lower that tax rate because you will have to pay catch-up at some point. And um, 
your RCMP costs are still unknown as far as retro payments, and those could be fairly significant, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. Yeah, I, I, I hear you what you're saying, but it does frustrate me that, that at that time I was told, no, we should leave that because the unknown, and that was, that was the end of it. So we did have to lower the tax rate by a, a very marginal amount, and I felt we could have uh, I, uh, really done more. But I just find it now, oh, yeah, we'll, let, let's, let's take you into the surplus. And it, it's something there bothers me about that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. CAO? I guess, uh, Mr. Chairman, the other comment I would make is you have no other source of funding to pay this money from. So that is your only choice. If you choose to provide this grant, that is your only source of funding to provide that grant. You wouldn't be allowed to borrow for this grant because it would be an operational expense. Um, so there is no other source of funding. It's the only thing we have to offer is either contingency reserve, which is money that's already been placed in the, in the reserve, or from the year-end surplus, which finance is doing up the year-end numbers now and can sort of set that aside um, to go towards this instead of into the contingency reserve. So we don't have a fund this large that could provide funds to this facility. Thank you. Next up, Councillor Musa. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, to add up on Councillor Rhino, like, I, I know the money of the the transfer tax still come till March. We, we budget in January, February, and I don't think much real estate happened in March. Like, I think, I think we should know, we, we should have an idea. Like, as a councillor, I think I should have an idea how much so far we have in surplus, because that's tax, taxpayers' money, and we could, we could help out in a year like that, like last year was a pandemic year. If we lower the taxes and then, add it, then raise it up next year, it doesn't matter. Like, we, we got, we, we, I think we should know. We should have an idea how much it is. Not the exact amount, but we should have an idea. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Seeing nobody left to speak, there's a motion on the floor. What, what's your bill? Question's been called. We'll go to the vote. All the votes are in, and the motion is passed unanimously. There's a second motion up there. Is anybody? Oh, sorry. Warden, go ahead. Uh, I would move the second motion. Okay. Moved by the warden, seconded by Councilor Garden Cole. Is there any discussion? Question. Question's been called. We'll go to the vote. And all the votes are in, and it's passed unanimously. Thank you, Adam. Oh, you're. Oh. Go ahead, Warden. Uh, thank you. Um, just following up on Councillor Musa's uh, uh, comments, um, I'd just like to ask um, if uh, finance staff could perhaps put together just a little memo and let us know where the year-end surplus is. Maybe we have that somewhere and just don't know where to pull it from. And maybe, if possible, things we have assigned to that year-end surplus since we determined approximately. Is, is that something that could be easily pulled out or would that require... I guess I'm asking Sue. Oh, it's me. Uh, through, the, through the chair, um, we are actively this week just finalizing those numbers. Janice is working on um, pulling all the motions right now of every motion that uh, suggested year-end surplus. Um, I do know, as Kim said, that we will have a surplus primarily because of the deed transfer tax, which we discussed at budget time. Um, we didn't know at that time if the trend was going to continue with the deed transfer. Uh, we are at 3.2 million at year-end. Um, but we are still finalizing the number. I don't have the exact number yet, but uh, it will be over a million dollars for sure. So um, probably in the next week, we'll have that finalized because the audit starts next week. Well, that would be great. I'm sure it can be circulated at that time. And then and, and that would have a good awareness. 
Yeah. And and that would include the breakdown of detransfer by district that was requested to, correct? Um, I'm not sure if I have that by next week. We are working on that as well. Okay. Um, but I'll uh, work on that too. All right. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Moving on. 619 Burncoat Road, Land Acquisition Ratification HST. Back to you, Adam. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a, a ratification motion we're looking for today. Uh, in January, staff were directed to look at acquiring uh, PID 45108339. In March 2022, the sale was completed, and uh, we did ratify that uh, already at less than the asking price. The ratification motion did not uh, identify HST as part of that. I um, left that out um, unintentionally. So when finance was reconciling the purchase, um, and we do our self-assessment for the to recover the portion of the HST, um, we need a motion for the sum of eleven thousand three hundred and fifteen dollars to cover our portion of the HST. Um, so we are bringing that forward for committee to ratify that. And to refresh uh, council's memory, that's the. I gave the PID, but it's a 619 Burnt Coat Road uh, property. Go ahead, Warden. Uh, I would move the recommended motion to ratify the HST portion of that purchase. Moved by the Warden, seconded by the Deputy Warden. Is there any discussion? Councillor Musa. Yeah, just a, just a question. I, uh, can, you, can you remind me where that money came from to buy that land? Like, was it... Uh, I hope it wasn't that. Burnt Coat Road property. Through okay. you, Mr. Chair, contingency. Okay. Wow. I was hoping we didn't borrow for it. <laughs> that's, that's my thing. Thank you. All right. So you know we left to speak. Question. Question's been called. Go to the vote. And the motion is passed unanimously. Next, we're looking for a motion to move in camera to discuss a land issue. Moved by Councillor Hebb, seconded by Councillor Musa. All those in favor? Aye. Aye.
Okay, will it be soon to be brought up on the screen? You're going to make the motion, Councilor Tingley? Just wait where we're at a camera. I just I'll come to you. Would I would I move both of them or just one of them? Might as well make both of them as presented. Good. I'd like to report we met in camera uh, about a contractual uh, issue. Uh, from that camera session, we have one motion coming, and I will go to Councillor Tingley. I'll move the uh, motions as recommended by staff for uh, 821 Burnt Coat Road, PID 4510846. I move for both motions. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Question. Question's been called. We'll go to the vote. Votes are in, and the motion is passed with Councilor Rhino voting nay. Look for a motion to adjournment for lunch. So moved. Move. Reconvene back at 1.45. Oh, shoot. Reconvene at 1.30. All those in favor? Aye. Aye.